Hello, I'm GC Mackay and today we're going to be taking a look at The Blind Owl by Sadiq Hedayat. First published in 1937, The Blind Owl is pretty famous, at least in the Persian area of the world. Um, it's, I think, still banned in Iran, which maybe I'll get onto a bit later, but Mainly, the, the reasons for that are that the book apparently inspired a lot of suicides after its publication and they henceforth decided to ban it for that reason, uh, which I think is a little bit thin, but... First off though, I suppose I'll give a thanks to Onward to Dystopia for the recommendation, although I use that term a little bit loosely it's a it's a weird one to recommend this because it's a total head fuck recommending this is kind of tricky i think people who watch this will enjoy it quite a lot but at the same time the word enjoy doesn't seem to be completely applicable to this novel um reviewing it is going to be a bit of a bitch but <laughs> I'll, um, I'll try and get through it and see what I can kind of come up with. So, the beginning of the story, we meet the um, unnamed narrator and he describes his longing for this beautiful woman that he sees outside of his house. We learn that he's an opium and uh, alcohol addict quite early on and he doesn't, um, he doesn't really seem to say when he's on either of the drugs, so you're kind of left in the dark, as it were, as to when he, when exactly he's actually under the influence or not. But as the story progresses, he's, um, he's infatuated by this woman that he sees outside and her beauty, uh, elegance and the fact, the way she looks at him is like no one's ever really looked at him this way before. And it's like through her kind of black majestical eyes she can see within his soul everything that he's been looking for since existing on this godforsaken planet. Um, what hooked me in straight away was how eloquent and lyrical the prose was. I was kind of immediately drawn in and reminded of Poe basically from the first paragraph I, th I think or at least the first few pages and I probably got to the fifth or sixth page before I kind of started to think, wait a minute, where's this going? So I think that is a credit to the writing itself, just as a kind of starting point, because it is, it's beautiful, really. But at some point you start to think, have I read that before? Didn't he already say that? Have I, am I rereading or is he doing that intentionally? So you kind of start, you start to get lost in the kind of swirling, spiralling madness of the piece pretty early on and the beginning kind of starts off like I mentioned with this woman that he seems infatuated with and he approaches her and she ends up in his inside his bedroom and eventually she dies and his solution to get rid of the body is to cut her up Poe <laughs> taken straight out of the Poe handbook that part is to cut her up into little pieces and put her in a suitcase and then um, outside there's this kind of what traditionally you probably think of as a kind of mentor I suppose but I, I found him to be an, a symbol of death essentially like death is throughout this novel it's like the main kind of uh, motif throughout it it's um, it's everywhere and outside of his house is this old man with his kind of I think his finger to his lips constantly which is referenced constantly as well um, and he takes him on a kind of hearse that's led by some horses that are basically like withering away oh, to a kind of graveyard once it gets there well before putting her in the ground the dude has to look at her again and when he actually opens up the suitcase she's already decaying and decomposing and all that it's pretty grim and then he gets his last look at her and puts her in the ground and then gets his ride back, tries to pay with certain coins, but then is refused. And then when he ends up back in his 
um, house or little shack, if you will, because it, it, it's difficult to describe the house because it seems like it's really small. Um, Eddie Yap describes it with this kind of geometrical kind of impossibility almost that it feels very cramped, like you're con constantly um, in a hearse of your own, essentially, when you're living inside this building. And once he returns, he seems to, he, he kind of wakes up and then the narrative re-begins, not in a way that it's, in, it's a different identity, but more it's a different perception of it. And throughout the piece, the unnamed narrator will, is constantly questioning whether anything he sees could be construed as reality. Does not everything seem to be a falsification of his own mind, or at least a, a viewpoint that is only true to him, and therefore is false to everyone else? This will have slight echoes of the last review I did of The Tenant because it does discuss things such as kind of alienation and isolation quite constantly and this kind of inside yearning for something more. Um, but that's where I'll go, that's all I'll go with um, spoiler wise because it's, it's very difficult to spoil it even if I did describe each part for you because, because you really just get lost inside the spiral of it all. He forgot to mention... What did he forget to mention? He forgot to mention stuff. Yeah, the cobra venom. There's a part with the cobra venom where two men have to fight for the love of a woman and they have to stay in a cave with a cobra. And the first one to get bitten and die Is the obvious loser. Yeah, there's Cobra. He forgot the Cobra venom in the wine and the knife and the constant talking of decomposition. <laughs> Although I did read quite a lot of the beginning quite quickly, it didn't compare to how quickly I was reading it towards the end because that's when I was just inside the mind of the narrator who by all means is so unreliable that you can't really trust anything he says after a while but you're still very enthralled by his story and taken in because when he returns back to the house he moves on to be describing <laughs> the woman he's married to who he only refers to as the bitch because he grew up with her um she's not a relative or anything because I think they're both orphaned and he actually only agrees to marry her because of his mother and then it happens to be <laughs> the fact that this woman who he calls the bitch actually looks like his mother as well which so it's got this kind of Freudian psych psychology slipped in there as well um, and it gets very bizarre and I suppose it's worth mentioning that Hedy Yat himself was an opium addict and an alcoholic and he struggled with a lot of these issues that are described within the book. And he did commit suicide himself by gassing himself, I think, in the same city of Paris than when he actually wrote the piece, which is kind of eerie when you think about it. Um, however, I wouldn't really say that his addictions are, you know, the most poignant points of the piece at all. I think that's a kind of requisite for what he was trying to say. But at the same time, because you've got a narrator that is so kind of unreliable and untrustworthy, but also quite clearly mentally deranged, it's very difficult to tell when he's on an opium trip or when he's just hallucinating because he's not taking opium. Um, if, if any of you out there have been drug addicts at any point, I being mainly an alcoholic, um, I've had moments where I've drunk so much that it's very difficult for me to really tell what was going on at times. And you, I think you do actually suffer hallucinations, which is kind of an, a thing that not many people know. But I definitely had moments where I was questioning my own reality quite a lot and not really knowing what the fuck was going on. And this piece is a very nice reminder of that, to be honest. It kind of... The brilliance of it is that although it does repeat quite a lot of phrases throughout, 
but not always um, ad verbatim because sometimes it will mix it in in the middle of a paragraph or towards the end and it will kind of flip around the kind of uh, context of it. So it actually ends up giving the initial narration of the beginning a different element and it kind of spirals them all in together. So you're not really ever sure of which one to believe. But of course, if the guy is mentally unwell and a drug addict, it kind of makes no difference to whether he's actually on a trip or not or whether he's just inside his normal kind of way of thinking because he's constantly trapped inside this fucking like it feels like just a really small room with a kind of side kitchen and there's really kind of no space within it and he doesn't really do anything he's sort of like, he feels like he's describing his own death a lot of the time and that's what there's other bits where he feels like an outsider as well which is why it reminds him of the tenant because that's when he feels ostracized by society and Hedy Yat described them as the rabble men who adhere to society's rules with a disgusting aplomb. He claims he's a, and I think this is true, that he, for a living, he paints um, pen cases. But and at the beginning he does describe this and because he's painting the woman he describes, so he only ever paints this as well. And the thing about the owl is in reference to the shadow he sees on the wall of himself. But due to the angle of it, it sometimes replicates a kind of owl-like shape. But that, of course, as well, is another omen of death, whenever you're in kind of animal um, imagery and stuff like that. It's another kind of point towards that so and the woman he sees is constantly in black which is another reminder of death throughout the whole thing but it's also i think what hedy was really explaining throughout it or trying de trying to demonstrate was the frailty of the human psyche and i think that's what he achieved wonderfully throughout it um but that isn't to say that it's a pleasant experience to read because it's fucking harrowing i, I found I, I was like I felt trepidation just going through it, but I was also addicted to the writing like the opium of the narrator kind of thing. So it was just like I was just flowing through it. And it wasn't because I was trying to get through it as quickly as possible. It was more to do with the fact that I felt to be within the kind of labyrinthian kind of spiral that it kind of created, where my own mind and its need for meaning and linear structure was clinging, clinging on to anything it could fucking get its hands on but it couldn't really make sense of any of it. And therefore it kind of really reminded me of the kind of unconscious, the subconscious all at work and all kind of interlocking and interlacing within each other. And therefore was creating this kind of horrific kind of idea within it. Um, what keeps you reading is, is the beauty of the kind of prose within it. It is so, I don't know, I, I was kind of blown away by some of the sentences throughout it and how they just kind of leave you thinking kind of a lot and how you perceive things as well and how things might remind you of things that you still cherish as a memory but then when you really analyse it that memory is has been falsified over the years by your own psyche in the now and therefore that's where the horror of it kind of is derived because it is described as a horror um, but if you're looking for kind of ooh scary kind of stuff it's more scary because of the fact that it does remind you of the kind of the fact that you'll never know who you are and I think that is what Hedy Yap was really saying throughout it and I don't think he ever really moved on from that either because it's um, it's very palpable throughout it and you've got a lot of kind of fable like references within it and he's almost mocking the whole narrative structure itself a lot of people would probably point to the fact that it's a very Eastern novel compared to be, being a Western one, but I, I find those comparisons a bit boring because for me it's just talking about the horrors of the human condition and it's very human throughout it and if you can face yourself enough to really see how much you believe and think is true, but then once you actually really analyse it you can kind of sense that, no, you're just another product of the environment that you were born into and you had no say in whatever came about. Um, 
then yeah, that's when you'll get the kind of main juice of the story. In some ways it does feel like it's two narrators at times. It, it does feel like that, like that a little bit, but it's two narrators describing the same story or different versions of the story that get interwoven into the same overall plot, if you will. But plot is probably the wrong word for this because the middle is the end and the end is the beginning. So it's like you can't really make any sense of it a lot of the time. So if that's the kind of thing that's up your alley, fucking go for, go for it. You'll get a lot out of this. And there's, there's many things that I'm not really, um, you know, concentrating on because there are kind of political messages within it. Um, and I think Hedia was making kind of a bit of a social commentary at times of when he grew up and the period he had to live through, which was very Kafka-esque. And reading the book, you can definitely see a lot of um, influence from Poe, Kafka, Dostoevsky, I would say, um, maybe a little bit of Tolstoy. And um, I don't know who else, but there is a kind of element of kind of a metamorphosis within it and this kind of whole idea of us being these kind of disgusting creatures really like deep down we're kind of all decomposing and that kind of idea so there is this kind of element of the self illusion is kind of made a mockery of by the body that is constantly in a state of decay so yeah it's pretty cheerful stuff but at the, uh, the same time, I, I fucking, I, I adored it. I was in awe, really. Um, the repetitions do get a little bit grating. I can't say that they don't. It does get a bit like, oh, fucking, it's just like, because it really, for me, it, it reminded me of times where I'd catch myself saying something that I remembered saying a couple of years before. So therefore I was put in that kind of existential moment of feeling like I hadn't moved on from my own thought pattern and then it reminded me of the kind of workings of my own mind still being the same as they were two years before. So this idea that you're always kind of bettering yourself is bullshit, really. Um, you're still kind of stuck in the same pattern of thoughts that you probably had since becoming conscious or at least self-aware. Um, yeah, they might grow, but the, the pattern of your own behaviour doesn't really change that much. And a therapist will tell you that that can be changed, but I, I don't think it can really. Once it's settled in there, it's, um, there's no escape. And that's why I think Hidayat describes so brilliantly, and there is a madness within that, of course, but to face that and to really describe it as well as he does is something that I can't really... that I can't really think of anything else I can compare it to, really, if I'm honest. Um, although there are obvious influences, especially Poe, um, I wouldn't say it's a Poe-like story, apart from a few incidences where, yeah, the deaths are taken straight out of the Poe handbook. But apart from that, it's got its own style, its own kind of weaving within it. It's got this kind of craziness of just the conscious mind I suppose or the perhaps the illusion of the conscious mind um, and yeah but yeah it's short that's a kind of solace to be taken from it because and I think purposefully as well because um, I think Hiliat probably had the sense of mind to know that he couldn't keep going on and on and on with this narrative because it does get very like stop start back around stop start back around topsy-turvy you know but because of its um, novella length, it does actually fit perfectly within it. Um, and the, yeah, there's loads of symbolism within it. There's loads of imagery that's just beautifully described. Um, you feel like you're in a dream a lot of the time reading it, or at least on an opium trip or something of that nature. So you begin to question your own um, sense of reality within the book itself. And I read a couple of phrases that say, that Hediat was trying to create an experience from the book rather than the book describing an experience. And I think that's what he achieved so well. It's like the relentless kind of relish I had reading it, especially like at the middle point where I was just so 
lost in its kind of spiralling within spirals of madness that I was just like, fucking hell, this is like... And then you, once you're at the end of it, you kind of, you can take a a nice, you know, bit of respite, but at the same time, it kind of, you feel it still lingering around you quite a lot after. And yeah, it's, um, it's fucking impressive. It's, um, it's, it's definitely shot up there for one of my favorite novellas for sure. Cause it's like, I haven't read anything like it to be honest. And at moments I still feel as if I'm trapped within the deja vu of the novel itself, um, in my own life. So yeah, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone who's in a kind of particularly unstable <laughs> frame of mind because it's, uh, it's, um, it, it won't do you many favours, let's say that, but if you are feeling brave, uh, dive into it and yeah, let me know what you think in the comments below. Um, thank you very much for watching. I've been, I've been GC Mackay, I was about to say, that's a fucking weird thought. Uh, well, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's a good, maybe it's an apt way of finishing it. I've been GC Mackay during this review. <laughs> And I'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Bye. Or hello. I don't know anymore. And the, the other thing about just being disgusting is, in the kind of Kafkaesque sense, is being aware of yourself creates this kind of dissatisfaction and disgust. But that disgust also leads to a lust. And so, really what turns on the narrator actually disgusts him at the same time so there there's a lot of uh crisscrossing in that regard <laughs>